Good morning. I'm Matt Herndon, the CEO of the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare. I want to welcome everyone to the inaugural event of our new series, Compassion Conversations, where we'll learn, learn more about the role of compassion in leadership and organizational culture from healthcare and other leaders. I want to briefly thank our national business members for their year-round support of this and other programs. Um, thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome our first Compassion Conversation guest, Rashika Fernandapool. Rashika is the CEO and co-founder of Iora Health, an innovative primary care provider organization focused on restoring the humanity in healthcare. Good morning, Rashika. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank, thanks for joining us. So Rashika, all stories start with the beginning, and, and I'd love to just start by hearing how you uh, became a doctor. How did you enter medicine? So, you know, it sounds trite, but I was fascinated by the complexity and the beauty of biology and how, how the body works and, and of being human and being a doctor seemed like a great way to be able to work with both, both sides of that and wanted to apply it to, to helping real people. And so obviously, you know, so much is thrown at you as a, as a young med student, a resident. Um, what were some of your early impressions um, as a new physician? You, you know, I, it became really clear to me really quickly that despite all the great things about potentially being a doctor and being able to help people, that the system clearly wasn't set up to let us do it. I, I have a moment, Matt, where I clearly remember um, it was a February day in Boston. I was on staff at a faculty practice at Mass General. Um, and those of you who know the New England know in February it gets dark and cold and I had 30 patients booked uh, and they all showed up, right? You always hope for no shows. I had barely enough time to go to the bathroom, let alone uh, have lunch. Uh, I, they had to put a new electronic health record in and I couldn't figure out how to use it. So I had to scrawl notes on a piece of paper and I had to spend two hours after work while my family was having dinner again without me, you know, typing my notes in. And, um, and I had a colleague who was sitting next to me and she said something very profound. She said, Rashika, every day I lose a little piece of my soul. Every day I lose a little piece of my soul. We went into this to help people. We have such incredible skills and ability to help them. They come to us such big needs, but I can't do it in the system. And then this is the, 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 the damning thing. And it seems to be getting worse and not better. And that's really what told me like, we need to fix this system. Wow. And so, um, you know, clearly you have a, vi a vision around how you are a health, but you, you had a vision more broadly for primary care. Can you just what from that experience, from conversations like that with your with your colleague at the time, what what you know what was the vision that you started to to in, you know form? So I think the crux of it was that you know it's not a secret, by the way, that the current system doesn't work. It doesn't work for patients. It doesn't really work for doctors. It doesn't work for teams. It doesn't work for for the economics of the system. It's bankrupt in the country. But what everyone else was doing, and which I had done for a bunch of my career up to there, is what I call the incremental change model is why don't we then tweak this and make a little change here, here and there, and maybe that'll work. And I think the core part of the vision is maybe this thing is rotten to the core. <laughs> and maybe what we need to do is simply tear it down and start over. We need a completely different vision of what it is to deliver care. We ought to start with primary care, by the way, because it's closest to the consumer, um, but we ought to build in. The problem with typical primary care, despite really good people and really good intentions, maybe better than anywhere else, is we have turned it into this transactional system, document code bill next, document code bill next. That's why patients feel like they're, right. you know, it's on a line. It's why doctors feel like they're on a hamster wheel. And I think the core was maybe we need to rebuild the system on the basis of relationships and not transactions. Uh, and that's really what the vision was. Rebuild the system completely on relationships. So, um... You know, big vision. Um, I'm sure a lot of obstacles and challenges along the way that you know you're probably still dealing with um, in some regards. What 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 were some of those challenges as you started to think about how you were going to execute on this vision? Yeah. So the, the the biggest one really is that it's it's like pulling on a string, right? And you start saying that you're just going to rebuild based on relations. You realize you have to change everything. You have to change the payment model, right? This fee-for-service payment model gets in the way. You have to change the space design, change the team, change the process. These electronic health records we have, the Epics and Cerners of the world were built for the old system. So what you realize very quickly is you have to change everything. And that's a very hard task. 
Uh, I think the second big one is that, um, again, despite largely good people, that we, we have built in this country, you know, whether, ex whether intentionally or not, this what I would call a medical industrial complex which are, you know, everyone, you know, the, the health plans, the health systems, the consultants, the pharma companies were sort of in cahoots. I use that sort of, uh, because in some ways we built the system where they actually make money and, and do better if they keep people sick. <laughs> because, you know, the worst thing you can do is make someone healthy and not because they paid per thing they do. And so uh, lots of opposition from the medical industrial complex. So really those uh, are just some of the things that we've had to face over the last 20 years or so. So, you know, at some point, this this vision um, uh, turned into an action plan and um, led to your thinking around um, a new primary care model. Um, tell us a little bit more about that, um, the origins of Iora and 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 how you started to move on this vision. Yeah, so almost exactly. You know, I've been thinking about this for a while, obviously, and sure. it became very clear to me that I just had to do it. Right, we can talk about this all we want. We can we can write papers about it. We can you know postulate, but 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 I need to build it. Right, there are lots of so the, the ideas at the thirty five thousand foot level are obvious. Uh, the hard part is what's at the one foot level, and the only way to do that is actually build it. So I, I seventeen years ago, I quit my last day job. I started a little practice in Arlington, Massachusetts, called Renaissance Health, the rebirth of primary care. By the way, bad idea because no one can spell Renaissance. Right, so don't do that. Um, and that sort of changed into then starting to work with some employers and some union trusts. About 10 years ago, uh, we were finally able to raise some venture capital money to be able to sort of try to get this to scale and started Iora, by the way, no, nice short word, um, started Iora. So we today have uh, 47 practices across the country. We're in 10 different cities, coast to coast, Seattle, Phoenix, Tucson, Denver, Houston, uh, et cetera. And, 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 and really the idea is let's demonstrate what this new model looks like, right? I think um, one of my great favorite quotes from the Cheshire Cat and Alice in Wonderland, if you don't where you know where you're going, all roads will lead you there. So let's actually build a vision of where we're gonna right. go. Maybe that'll help move things forward. So, um, you know, I alluded to it at the opening um, that Iora has this, this motto of restoring the humanity in healthcare. Can you? Tell us a little bit more about that. What does that mean for your patients? What does that mean for your staff? What is that? Does that translate into specific experience at each of those, each of those levels? It is. So we've been able to completely rethink, you know, the culture, the space, the technology to really help people um, uh, improve their health. Right. So at the core, what we've done is say our job is not to do more stuff to people, generate more nine and two one four codes. Our job is to actually make people healthier. Right. And by the way, if, if we don't make people healthier, we're wasting our time, <laughs> completely wasting our time. Um, so let, let me actually illustrate with a story, Matt. So we had a patient, one of our early practices, her name okay. was and I was I was a doc and uh, uh, the health coach. So part of our model is a very elaborate team based model with folks from the community who are picked for empathy, actually, and compassion to help engage with patients. So the health coach called me, hey, doctor, there's a new patient here. She's a hot mess. So I walk in and she was, her name was Joyce. Her hair was sort of disheveled, blank look in her eyes, in and out of work, not taking her medicines, um, in and out of the emergency room. So we met her, got her with the program and she um, you know, started meeting with her health coach, coming to groups that we do, et cetera. I had to leave that practice because I was trying to start a second one. And I came back six months later and the doctor took over me. Uh, Neil said, remember that lady who came in the first week, Joyce, we all said what a hot mess she was. She's back in, I want you to meet her. I was like, sure. So I walk in the room and, and I can't recognize her. She looks amazing. Hair is combed, little makeup on, glint in her eye, back to work, taking her meds. She's, um, you know, no ER visits. And I was like, Joyce, you look amazing. She said, thank you, doctor. I've never felt better. So then I asked her a quick question. I was like, Joyce, what have we done to help you? She'd had doctors before. She'd had right. insurance. And she said something very profound. She said, doctor, you all cared about me. You taught me to care about myself and I didn't want to let any of us down. You cared oh. about me. You taught me to care about myself. I didn't want to let any of us down, right? That's the sharp end of the sword. That's what fixes healthcare. We have gotten so focused on all this other billing, coding, all this other crap, meaningful use. I can name hundred ACO models, all irrelevant, right? I mean, they're, they're important, but if we don't actually focus on compassion, 
you cared about me, you taught me to care about myself. Self-compassion and compassion for others, it doesn't work. So that's why we've built this whole thing about this. We have to start, Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos, uh, rest his soul, unfortunately passed away with one of our earliest investors. Um, and, and he really taught us about, you have to start with compassion within your team, right? If the team doesn't feel compassion, how do you think you're gonna treat other people with compassion, right? It's sort of an abused sort of children cycle. So you've got to do that, treat them. And then you got to treat the patients with compassion and empathy, and then they will improve their life. And that will lower their, that will improve their health. That will lower healthcare costs. Then you can capture some of that, right? So that's the core of what Iora is. And so, um, you know, obviously compassionate care is something that all providers want to deliver. Um, it's, it's why, why people go into the profession. Um, can I ask a business twist on it though? Do you, do you think compassionate care can be a market differentiator for organizations like Iora? Do, you know, will patients seek out those organizations that they perceive as being fundamentally more compassionate? So I think at two levels, really bad. So one, three levels, actually, where it's a business driver. The first is we will drive uh, team members to come to Iora. We will get the best doctors, the okay. best this because we all want to be in an organization that's compassionate. I, I think that's what we want. Number two is patients will get it, right? They will vote with their feet, right? To be actually our theory of change, how are we going to change healthcare is what I call the Southwest Air, Airlines theory of change, right? So 1980s, high fares, crappy service, what changed, right? It wasn't American and Delta waking up and deciding to be better. It wasn't the government. It wasn't consultants. It was one thing only, a new entrant showing up, you know, Building a new model based on compassion, love is their motto, getting customers vote with their feet. That not only gave those customers a better experience, but more importantly, it kicked Delta and American in the behind said, we better change or we're gonna lose our shirt, right? That's what we're trying to do is, is drive change in, um, in teams and then drive changes in patients to vote with their feet. And then the third part is we will get better outcomes. Remember the joy story. We get better outcomes as a result of that. It's not an either or, it's a both end. That's why we'll be successful. So, I mean, this is not easy. Compassionate care is not easy. You were, you were talking about some of just the challenges that, that were in front of you as you founded Iora. Um, I don't know, what, what makes compassionate care hard? I mean, even though I think all providers want to, to offer that kind of care, it's, it's not easy at the same time. What makes compassionate care hard in your view? Yeah, so, so, so I completely agree with you, Matt. I think that in general, some exceptions, uh, the people who go into healthcare, it, they do it because they're compassionate, right? If they weren't, they'd be doing other things. They'd be hedge fund right. managers. They do other things, maybe, right? This is why they go to work. Um, the problem is we have structured the system. And by the way, remember the first comment, it's getting worse and not better to actually uh, actively go against that, right? We just layer on all this other crud to try and, um, you know, whether it's billing codes or stupid rules or um, bad incentives, et cetera, right? I think that's the problem. You know, so that's why, by the way, the way we're gonna fix this is not by just adding more on. So much of what we do in healthcare is tell people do everything you're doing and we're gonna add something more, whether it's a medical home program or an ACO program. One of my favorite quotes is from Michelangelo and they asked Michelangelo, um, how did you get this beautiful sculpture, the Pieta? You know, we're sitting in Florence. He said, it's really simple. I take a block of stone and I chip away everything that's not the pieta, right? Take a block of stone, chip away everything, not the pieta. That's what we need to do in healthcare, not add more stuff on. We need to take the crust away to allow the, the core, which is a compassionate, which is what people went into it, to be able to show up again, right? So it's a take stuff away thing. And that's, I think, what we're trying to do at IR. Well, I mean, organizational culture, um, a culture grounded in compassion that does not that does not happen on its own. Um, you know, there's a role for leadership in creating that culture. I, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about your leadership style and and how would you describe it? Who's influenced it? Um, yeah, no, it's a great question. So, so in general, my style is um, I think the biggest role of leaders, right? And the, the difference between leader and a manager of a leader is to set vision and just be really clear, here's the vision. And, and there is no varying from that. For us, it's restoring humanity to healthcare. We wanna change the industry. 
Um, and then it's, it's continually do it in a variety of ways, telling stories like the one I did, getting out there and, and little artifacts. And so we, we, you know, we early on uh, talked about what our values are and we came up with a set of values and we said, well, instead of, and, and by the way, the, the first value is feel empathy. And um, so that's the first one because that's the core right. of what we do. Um, now, instead of putting it on the wall, we said, how can we let make this real? So what we created is these little uh, values cubes. I just picked one up, everyone's desk. It's a little foam cube, which has all our values on it. And the key is they lie around. And if any, if you see anyone, including myself, not following a value, you take the cube and you chuck it at them. <laughs> they're, they're just hard enough that you feel it. It won't draw blood, hopefully. Um, but and it's- The doctor's on site if it does, okay. Good. Exactly, but it's, it's about you know making this real to people. So, so one is set the vision and really be key about it. You kind of have too many things and said it. The second is I think can hire great people and give them space to work, right? And let them execute. Don't get in the way of managing the micro stuff. They are better at it than you are. Um, but occasionally be willing to step in if you think your vi the vision trumps little things. And I think that's it. I've been really fortunate to have a great number of mentors and heroes, Don Berwick, uh, Tony Shea I mentioned, Paul Farmer, you know, who are really people who sort of were brave enough to challenge the system and say, we need to rebuild these systems um, to, to make them better. And, and so Rashika, we've touched on it in a couple different ways, but what about um, compassionate leadership? Um, how would you describe compassionate leadership? Why does it why does it matter? Yeah, so so I think we are in a really moment of crisis in healthcare, right? Yep. In, a, in a variety of ways, and and I think you know again in primary care, doc, I'll talk about primary care, but applies in general is this this crisis of burnout. And I think through the core, and, and people, say, you know, we should teach people resilience, all that. No, we, we are really resilient. The key is, is, I think we've created this industrial medicine. Right, maybe it's, that's a way to talk about it. industrial medicine, and it doesn't speak to our soul. Right, I think the people who have looked at this carefully have said we're inflicting moral injury on the people working in healthcare uh, by doing this. And I think we need leaders to get us out of this. Um, we need patients hated as bankrupt the country, and I think there's been another failure of leadership, by the way, uh, among healthcare leaders because they're too busy chasing sort of short term, whether it's, you know, just follow the rules as opposed to say, maybe these rules don't work. Um, we need compassionate leadership to get us, get us out of this. Uh, and, and, and it takes some courage, by the way. So one of our other uh, things is courage, right? So it takes some courage to go against sort of the grain. But I think if we don't do that, we're going to really re regret it. Well, Rashika, I mean, obviously, compassionate leadership has been in demand. Leadership in general has been challenged. Um, frontline healthcare workers have been challenged in obviously unimaginable ways over the past year. Um, I, I'd, I'd love to just kind of uh, take a step back and talk a little bit about COVID and its impact on healthcare. I, I'd like to maybe just hear if you have any takeaways from Iora about how your team has adapted. I mean, COVID has shined such a bright light on so many areas and we'll get to a few of them in a minute, but are there any adaptations that you've made at Iora just in response to, to COVID? And are, have there been lessons learned, um, innovations that may stick you know, post COVID? Yeah, I think, um, and so, so I'm really proud of how we and really everyone in the healthcare system and particularly in primary care were able to pivot very quickly. I think the biggest change has been to rethink about what we do in sort of what I'd call an omni-channel delivery model, right? So I think we were very stuck in primary care about in-person and, and it's driven by the payment model. We get paid for in-person doctor visits so that's what people did. It's ridiculous, it's 2021, right? Um, that what we need to do is be able to serve our patients a variety of ways. And by the way, the way to do this is not unfortunately the way the industry in general is going, where there are companies like Bowie, there are chatbot companies that you can do a little text with your doctor. There are companies like Teladoc where you can only do video chats, but with a random schmo you've never met. You can go to a practice, but you have to go in person. And there are companies that might go to your house like Landmark. That's ridiculous. The same patient has all those needs at different times. Some needs are better met by a text message. Some are better met by a video message. Some are better met in person because we need to do in person. Some we need to come to your house because you're too sick. What we're building, and I think hopefully will survive COVID, is this omni-channel delivery model. By the way, retail and banking have figured it out. We need to stop organizing healthcare on the basis of our little needs and our little silo. And we need to start organizing on the needs of the consumer, the patient, the person. And that's what it is. I think it's omni-channel. Now, what's happened, by the way, is 
part of what's enabled that is patient demand. Part of it is the technology, but this has always been, you know, we've always had Zoom, uh, but it's, it's we've, we've put a lot of the stupid rules in advance. <laughs> and what I really hope is as the pandemic knock wood sort of starts to wane, we don't put these stupid rules back in. The world didn't collapse, right? So, so state-based regulation of telemedicine is a great example. It's such a stupid rule. We have a practice up in Hanover, New Hampshire. Yeah. Right? College employees. It's literally, you know, a few hundred yards across the river from Vermont. The old stupid rule is if a patient was from Vermont, which many of your patients are, we couldn't do telemedicine with them because it was practice medicine across state lines. Completely asinine. Medicine's the same everywhere, right? So, so again, I think hopefully many of these rules will, will stay in abeyance. And I think these omni-channel delivery models will actually continue to proliferate. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I alluded to this just a minute ago. Obviously, COVID has shined, you know, a very bright light on the problems around racism and health equity. Um, COVID has just, um, I think, really triggered a, a much larger needed reckoning in that space. Um, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts about what, what role you see for compassion and compassionate care in addressing issues like systemic racism, health equity. Um, how do you think about that right now? Oh, I think it's a huge issue. I think if you ask, you know, apart from maybe climate change, the biggest issue facing our society just in general is inequity. Right, whether it's racial, it's income, and those have all been getting worse and not better. And I think if we don't solve these, uh, it's not going to be a sort of society we want to live in. And I think it's also going to bubble up in all sorts of badness. So we have to fix these issues. Um, I think those, these start with compassion, right? It's uh, Paul Farmer, again, one of my mentors, who I yep. mentioned, he said something great about you know, the root of all problems in the world is thinking some lives are worth less than others. Right, so you have to start with saying all lives are the same, right? And we need to treat them the same. And if anything, we should be building models and spending our time on trying to preferentially help the people who need the help. So we've built our model. We, we largely serve low income communities uh, and we do it because we think those are the people who need our help more. To be quite honest, rich people, they're doing just fine, right? but, but poor, largely minorities. And they've done awfully in COVID, as you said, Matt. You know, I think we have, we, we have a practice, we have 12 practices in Phoenix and it's awful. We deal with elderly, largely Hispanic patients who um, you know, are trying really hard to stay protected, but their kids who live in the multi-generational household are essential workers, they have to go into work. And unfortunately, there are idiots in the community who don't believe in COVID, think it's a political ruse, so they walk in the store without masks, they give COVID to the kids who then go home and give it to the parents and the parents pass away, right? And this is awful. And people, to be honest, like you and me, who are sitting at home on Zoom, we're not gonna get COVID, right? It's like almost impossible. So it really is very grossly unfair. We've been trying very hard to serve those communities. How do we, by the way, in this move to digital care as part of it, we, want to, we need to make sure we don't make the problem worse. So we've got programs, we do about a thousand a month where tablet deliveries, we actually go to people's houses, hand them a tablet, link to the broadband so they can communicate digitally with us. We mail them tablets, right? So we need to make sure that, um, that in this move to omnichannel delivery, we don't leave people out. By the way, the same argument in education. Yeah, I mean, um, it's helpful that to hear that, you know, that real life experience in, in your practices in places like Arizona. Um, the other area I did want to ask about is um, medical education. We're hearing about the Fauci effect with kind of record applications to med school and high levels of altruism in terms of medicine. Um, but um, we also know that once um, individuals get to med school, there can be this cliff with respect to some of that altruism, the, the feelings of um, you know, mission and purpose. Um, what, how do you kind of see med medical education right now? Um, is, it, is it successful in churning out healthcare professionals who um, can practice compassionate care? Are there, is there work to be done there? How do you how do you look at medical education and how it's doing right now in that regard? Yeah, so so I'm I, I'm a pre med advisor at Harvard, so I get a chance every year to take a couple of kids who are thinking about going to medicine and help them with their applications and write the letter. And, and you're you're right, virtually everyone who's going in on the front end is incredibly compassionate, or else they wouldn't be doing it. Um, uh, what happens, unfortunately, the system by the time they kick them out the other end, has squeezed a good piece of that out for many people, and I think that's just awful. Right, and I think we need to do that. And again, it's probably not their fault because that's the world they're preparing people for. 
Um, I think within the first couple of years, the faculty are in a nice con contained con environment. They did say the right things and do the right thing. But then what happens is you go onto the wards and you're hit with this jolt of reality. Uh, and it's skepticism and it's cynical and it's you know burnout and all those things. I, I think one of the things we haven't done, and again, I'll talk about primary care, is let's create, uh, if you go into most faculty practice where, that where resident, where interns and residents and medical students get exposed to what this is, they're awful, right? They are, they are mills, they are poorly structured, they're poorly staffed, they're, they're still practicing the old way of medicine, not transactional, widgets off a line, et cetera. I think we've fallen asleep in not creating um, places in medical schools where people can see what the future is. Stop exposing them to the past. Hopefully we won't ever do that. Let's expose them to the future. And it's, and it's shocking how little of that we have, unfortunately. And by the way, the job you need to do being a doctor in the future and in an IOR practice is not a little different, it's completely different, right? And, and all this stuff we do, why exactly are we in, insisting on people taking organic chemistry or calculus in medical school, right? I can't remember the last time, you, you, you need to add numbers, that's about it. There are all sorts of other things about psychology and behavior change and compassion and uh, data that we should be doing. So I think we need to rethink our education from the ground up in order to foster these sorts of thoughts. Great. Well, Rashika, we, we actually were coming up on the nine o'clock hour. I, we do have a couple of questions. I, want, I wondered if I could um, toss a couple of them to you um, as, we, as we begin to um, wind down here. The, um, the first question is around whether some of your practices that you've applied in Iora could potentially translate into ho in hospital-based care settings. Do you think, or do you see an opportunity to apply some of the principles that you've applied at Iora to hospital-based care? So I think absolutely, right? So, so I'll just name a few off. off sure. So, so the one is really this team-based care, right? This realization that in order to make someone better, whether it's longitudinal in primary care or in the hospital during an episode, that we all have different roles and that the team ought to play a role. So, so we do huddles every morning with a whole team, everyone, the, you know, obviously the doctor, the nurse, the health coach, the social worker, um, even, you know, we have some people picking up people, the people who give them rides are all part of the team and we talk about our patients. Um, in the hospital, you know, again, because I still attend uh, in the hospital, we, we sit in our silos and we barely do that. Really having, you know, ways of working as a team and tying that together. By the way, that team huddle, the doctor doesn't run the huddle. The first thing we say every day is we all run the practice, we all run the huddle, and everyone takes turns running. Again, so it's sort of equalizing power dynamics. I think there's a lot of that that can happen. I think rethinking our IT systems that are more relational. I think thinking about how to involve families in care. Right, so I think we have this misguided notion about, so, and by the way, it's gotten worse in COVID because we keep the family out. Um, this is not a personal thing. Health is a social thing. And how do we get caregivers and families involved? And there's some pretty cool things I've seen where they do family rounds every day and the family open charts. We have a thing where our patients can see the whole medical record. Hospitals can do that too, right? And again, these are very scary things, but they all help with compassion and engagement. And I think it would lead to better outcomes. All right, let me we'll move to one other question. I'm sorry, um, we don't have more time for these uh, other questions. Um, here's a really practical question. What advice would you give a new doctor just starting out with their practice um, so that it can be a compassion-based one? What should, should that new doctor think about? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's a standard question everything, right? Just because this is a way that everyone's done it before doesn't necessarily mean it's the way it should be. I think we all have much more power than we think we do. Uh, you know, we started with one little practice and, you know, we've grown it into something, you know, we're still tiny in the big scheme of things, but I think are making progress. So I would say question everything, uh, decide how you want to practice, uh, and then just demand people to do it. You know, so we've gone to payers and we've said, we don't want to be get paid fee for service per thing we do because it doesn't let us do the thing we do. This is how we think we should get paid. And, you know, and most people will tell you no, but a few will tell you yes. Uh, and find those allies. And I think that's how we make progress. We, we need hundreds and thousands of us to say, we're gonna do something differently. Well, Rashika, as I said, we're just about at time. I wanted to wrap up with one last question of my own. And that is just a, an overarching question. What, with everything we've been through as, as a country, as, um, you know, as a world with COVID, you know, are there any, any particular things that just give you hope about the future of healthcare? What makes you hopeful? 
the, the probably the biggest thing that gives me hope is I think the change of generations. You know, I've got three kids who are in their you know teens and twenties, uh, and uh, you know, and and it's easy to make fun of the millennials and you know all of that. But 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 I think they have very different expectations, and I don't think they're going to put up with the crap and the excuses that we have been giving for why we can't fix healthcare. Right, the why we make people wait, why we treat them poorly, why we won't share information. Uh, I think they're not going to put up with that, and I think that creates the opportunity for people to say we're going to do things differently. So that's what gives me hope. Excellent. Well, Rashika, I want to thank you very much for joining us and and being our first guest for this new series, Compassion Conversations. Um, we will continue these events. Uh, we'll be posting the recording of today's session on our website at theschwartzcenter.org. Um, please stay tuned. Again, I want to thank our national business members for their support and most importantly, thank all of you for joining us today. Um, have a great weekend and thank you again.